kind of going to go over essentially you know uh, the the basics of OAuth, the terminology, and you know why the original uh, OAuth 2.0 spec like didn't quite cut it, and why we've had to make some uh, some alterations to the flows, uh, and uh, why it's still not perfect. So let's just uh, jump right on into it. Uh, let's see. So yeah, about me. My name is Pac Foley. I'm a security engineer. Uh, I currently work at uh, uh, Procore Technologies up in Santa Barbara. Uh, <clears throat> I for formerly worked solely on identity and access management. Um, so the things that I worked on in particular were OAuth implementation for you know, uh, distributed internal systems, as well as for third party uh, developers, um, session management uh, for our internal distributed systems, and uh, <clears throat> uh, SAML implementations and whatnot. <clears throat> All right, so what is OAuth 2? Uh, so OAuth is an authorization framework. Uh, it enables third-party applications to gain temporary access to a protected resource on behalf of a resource owner. Um, what OAuth 2 does not do, it does not define user authentication. However, it does define client authentication. Uh, a lot of people think that, that OAuth doesn't define authentication at all. It just doesn't define user authentication. Um, let's see. Uh, and, the, and the purpose really is to delegate that authentication. So the, it's a set of flows to delegate that, that user authentication to an authorization server. <clears throat> All right, so what defines the OAuth 2 framework? The framework is uh, defined by a set of uh, interactions called uh, uh, their authorization interactions called authorization grants. Um, the grants are restricted by the spec to the kind of client obtaining authorization and the type of resource owner granting that authorization. Uh, the four grant types are the authorization code grant, the implicit grant, uh, the client credentials grant, and uh, the the bad appendage there is the resource owner password credentials grant. And I'm just going to say right now, uh, that's no longer, <laughs> no longer recommended for anyone to use. And the original Auth2 spec, essentially, the, it was added to try to get people to start using uh, token-based authentication rather than uh, passing the username and password to an endpoint, which a lot of people have been doing. Um, and so these interactions, all four of those interactions, they take place between four defined roles. I'm going to find those roles real quick so that we know about you know, the terminology. So we have the resource owner, which is an entity of, uh, that's, that's capable of granting access to the protected resource. The resource server, which hosts the, the protected resource. <laughs> uh, and the client, which uh, is an application that's making the requests to the protected resource. And uh, that can be a web application, a user agent, such as like JavaScript running in a browser, uh, or a native application. Uh, there's the authorization server, and this is the server that's responsible for issuing tokens. It's also responsible for authenticating the user. OAuth 2 doesn't define how the user is authenticated, but they say that that has to happen. <clears throat> All right, so the most important terminology in OAuth, in my opinion, uh, are these, these four terms. Uh, OAuth separates uh, clients into two types, and you really have to if you're talking about delegating authentication to an authorization server. Uh, and the reason why is because of redirects and uh, uh, the, the, just the capability of being able to authenticate a client. So a confidential client is a client that is capable of securing its, uh, its credentials. Uh, a public client is not capable. So examples of a confidential client, the only kind of client that can do this is a web application. That's it. The only, that's simply the only, only client that can do it. Um, a public client can't keep its secret credentials confidential. Uh, examples of that are you know, a native application or a user agent JavaScript-based application. User authentication, everyone knows what that is. It's just a user claiming they are who they say they are. Um, 
a client authentication is a client you know, verifying that uh, a client is who they say they are. So the flows as defined in the original RFC for OAuth 2, uh, I tried to simplify this with this diagram just, just because so many folks, uh, developers will look at, at all these flows and just go, oh, I have a grab bag of flows. I'm going to pick the one that, that's going to be best for me to implement. Uh, but they don't, they don't take into consideration that these flows were actually created uh, in, to ensure that every kind of client and resource owner were picking the most secure uh, flow for that particular client and resource owner. So essentially what this is, is we have you know, the resource owner and the client type. If the resource owner is a user and the client is confidential, you're supposed to pick the authorization code grant or the resource owner password credentials grant. Um, if the, and the reason why is because in the authorization code grant, you can both authenticate the client and the user. Uh, in, if, if the resource owner is a user and the client is public, you can only authenticate the user because the client can't keep its credentials safe, right? So anyone could get those. Uh, there's just no way of authenticating a public client. <clears throat> if anyone tells you that you can, that's, it's, you just can't. <laughs> uh, people have made attempts at it, but it's just not possible. Uh, so uh, if the, of course, if the resource owner is the client, if your application owns the resource, it's really simple. Um, all you have to do is authenticate the client. Uh, and so uh, uh, client credentials grant is the one we use. And I'm going to go over those flows real quick. Um, so the easiest one, the one with the least problems, super simple. You have a client, and this is a confidential client, remember, so it's able to authenticate. It has a client ID in secret that it can pass to the authorization server. The authorization server can verify them, and it can pass back a token. Now, you can see that there's no refresh token uh, given here, and there's no reason to do that. Uh, you, as soon as the, the token expires, the client can just pass back its credentials and get another token. Uh, the, here's the, the authorization code grant. And so in, in this one, it's really meant for the resource owner to be a user and the client to be confidential. Uh, this is the most complicated of the flows. Um, but it sort of works like this. So you have this confidential client that's going to interact with a user agent, typically a browser, right? Um, and so it's going to start off with the client is going to send a 302 redirect uh, to the authorization endpoint of the authorization server. And so you can start from A. You hit the 302 redirect that hits the, the browser, right? Uh, the browser is going to redirect with the redirect URI and the client ID. It's going to land at the authorization server. At the authorization server, the client is then going to, or the, 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 uh, the client is going to usually respond with a form. And then the resource owner, if you follow B, uh, is going to authenticate via the browser. Uh, and uh, essentially at that point, uh, the authorization server is then going to ask the user if they grant access, uh, are granting the client access to the protected resource. If they do, they send back an authorization code. And that comes back in a 302 redirect. That comes and hits the browser and redirects to the client. Uh, and so it just, it, it, the authorization code comes in a param uh, in the redirect. Uh, and then, at this point, uh, also if you notice, that authorization code, if anyone's ever set up a proxy server, that can be intercepted, right? Maybe that's not a big deal here. Uh, but Imagine if that client was a public client. Uh, you'd, you'd be able to have the, the client credentials, and you'd be able to you know, make requests on behalf of the client. So <clears throat> at this point, the client has the authorization code, and it's then going to pass the authorization code along with its uh, uh, client ID in secret to the authorization server. That is going to authenticate the client. So we've authenticated the user. We've authenticated the client. Uh, now the authorization, is gonna, uh, the authorization server is going to respond with a token, uh, with an optional refresh token. So the reason why we have refresh tokens here is because we don't want to have the user have to authenticate 
over and over again, right? And so this basically, you've granted this application access. Uh, uh, so the client is now responsible for sending it back and authenticating and getting the refresh token. Um, so yeah, we've, we've authenticated the client, we've authenticated the user. And now we have the um, implicit flow. So this is originally designed for public clients. And the reason uh, why this was created is because you can't authenticate the client. So we implicitly grant authorization to this application by the user authenticating. So the way this works is it's the same. The client is going to send a 302 redirect to the user agent. This is probably going to be an operating system, maybe a browser. It depends on the implementation. Uh, it could be a mobile application. could be a de desktop application. Um, so, or even it's code running in a browser, so it could even be JavaScript. Uh, so this one is, it starts out the same. Uh, 302 redirect uh, hits the authorization server, user then authenticates, and then at this point it's different, right? Uh, the authorization server is then going to send a redirect with the access token in the param. Uh, and at that point, the, you can, however you'd like, parse out that, that access token. Uh, and then send back to the client. Now, the reason why we can't, I've already gone over why we can't authenticate the client, but, but this is essentially the most secure, uh, at that time, it was the most secure flow for public applications. All right, resource owner password credentials. I already said uh, in the newest uh, best practices um, uh, draft, which came out in July, uh, they, just, they just straight up said, just don't, don't use this, this flow anymore. And it's clear why. If, you, if, you're, do, if you're authenticating a third party application, uh, this would require you to, to ask the, the, the user to give you the credentials, their credentials. And so it trains users to expose their credentials to third party applications. Uh, so it's, it's just a bad flow. All right, uh, common misimplementation. Public clients such as native applications implementing the authorization code flow for the purpose of obtaining refresh tokens. I've seen this a lot of times. Uh, people don't, so with the implicit flow, uh, essentially there's no way of, since the client can't authenticate, every time you want a new token, you have to force the user to authenticate. Uh, and this this causes pain for developers of uh, you know native uh, of public applications. You know you don't want someone to have to authenticate every time a token expires, and so people have been incorrectly implementing the authorization code flow, which requires them at some point to pass the client ID in secret from a public application, which could be intercepted or decompiled from the code since it's on the device. <clears throat> Uh, and so the way this would work, essentially you start off at A, the public client is gonna redirect to the user agent. It's going to uh, then make the request to the authorization uh, server. The user is gonna authenticate. It's gonna 302 redirect with the authorization code. Uh, and then the, the public client is then going to have to pass back the client ID and secret with the authorization code to the authorization server. And that can be intercepted. And at that point, uh, you can make requests on behalf of a user and a client. <clears throat> um, so, so that last one that I just showed, like, is this really a big deal? Like, uh, it's a big deal if we haven't restricted the flow to only authorization code flow for this app, this third-party application. However, if we've allowed client credentials flow, that client ID and secret can be used to obtain a token without a user authenticating. So in this flow, like the user that had the device had to have authenticated, right? And so uh, I'm gonna show you why this is a big deal once we get the client ID and secret. And so what it is is, you know, someone could create a malicious app that claimed to be an integration with some legitimate app uh, and 
the malicious app can register its redirect URI with the operating system. And so any redirect sent back to the OS will be sent both to the legitimate app and malicious app. And so what happens is malicious app, it already got the client ID and secret from the last flow. And now it's installed on a whole bunch of devices. And at this point, anytime a user logs in, they're gonna get the authorization code and then they can get a token on behalf of that user who authenticated. And they can send those tokens off to you know, my server that I have. Uh, and I can play with them as I like. So more common misimplementation. Confidential clients implementing the implicit flow simply because it's easy to implement. I've seen this with third party developers all the time. They're like, well, I don't really care if these tokens expire. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a one, one time thing. I just wanna implement the uh, implicit flow. And, and essentially what this does, you know, typically these, these libraries that people use for OAuth, they have a default uh, expiration time on the tokens that is just always greater for the implicit flow because of the fact that the user has to authenticate every time. And so it opens up the un unnecessary risk of access token leakage and it, it unnecessarily removes client authentication. If you're a confidential client, you should definitely be authenticating the client. It just, it makes sense. <clears throat> so current, current best practices. So in light of the two previous issues, uh, a new flow was created um, and it's called P uh, proof key for code exchange. And essentially what it does is it, it, it allows these public clients to use a version of the authorization code flow where, uh, and allows them to get refresh tokens. Um, uh, however, they don't authenticate the client, and I'll show you how that works. So this is a little bit complicated, and I hope you guys can read this. <laughs> uh, but essentially, the way this, this starts out is you have the public client. It's going to start off the same way the other ones did. It's a 302 redirect to the authorization endpoint. Uh, this 302, uh, is, uh, it has in the params the client ID, uh, a transformed code verifier. So what that code verifier is, is it's an alphanumeric string with enough, enough entropy to not require salt or anything. Um, and they also pass the transform method. So transform code ver verifier, transform method, and redirect URI. Uh, the browser then uh, uh, sends that request off to author authorization server. The authorization server then stores the transformed code verifier on its end. Um, and uh, at that point, it responds with a form. Usually, this isn't always how it works, but typically responds with a form. The resource owner authenticates, uh, and then uh, 302 redirect is sent with the authorization code. Now, I showed you in that previous slide, if a native app uses the authorization code flow, that can be intercepted, right? However, it can't be used because on the request for the token, they require that you send the code verifier along in the request. And so at that point, it's, it's, it's impossible to use that intercepted authorization code. Um, so yeah, essentially uh, that, that post request goes, it's got the authorization code, the code verifier, no client secret. Uh, it, the transformed code verifier is uh, uh, validated to match the or the, the code verifier is transformed to validate that it matches the stored version, and then we respond with an access token. <clears throat> so, new specs. Uh, essentially, in the new, in the new security drafts, uh, we see that although PKC is recommended as a mechanism for protecting native apps, it's also recommended for all clients that use the, uh, the the uh, authorization code flow. And the reason why is because it still, it still keeps anyone from doing replay attacks with the authorization code and requires them to, to if they want to refresh, always sending the client ID in secret. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, let's see. I changed these slides up, so. So public clients. Clients sh uh, should not use the implicit grant or any response in issuing access to tokens in the redirect, right? And the reason why is because there's no need to now. Uh, 
it, the, implicit, the implicit flow has essentially become obsolete with PKCE. Um, clients should instead use the response type code. <clears throat> now, what, is the, what do the flows look like? So, so it's, it's simplified a lot. You notice uh, if it's a confidential client and the resource owner is a user, you have one flow. You use authorization code with PKCE. If it's a public client and the resource owner is a user, you use authorization code with PKCE. You just don't send the secret along in the request. It's the exact same flow. It's simplified things a lot. Uh, if you have a client who's the resource owner, it's confidential, client credentials. Also, I didn't mention the not viable. Clearly, you can't do authentication if neither your, public, neither your client or your user can authenticate. So, <laughs> so OAuth is perfect now, right? It's definitely not. Um, so PKC addresses the interception of the authorization code, but it does not entirely prevent uh, uh, client impersonation. I'm going to go through this as fast as possible because I have very little time. But essentially, it works like this. So you have a malicious application. You have the operating system or browser. You have authorization server, and you have a legitimate application. The redirect, uh, the 302 is sent to the operating system. It's got the transform code ver verifier, the uh, transform method, legitimate apps, redirect URI, and client ID. That's then sent to the authorization server. And at that point, uh, the authorization server has stored that code verifier, right? Uh, and so this is malicious app makes the first request. And then legitimate app comes in, and it makes an authorization request. The user actually authenticates, and legitimate app's authorization code is sent both to uh, the malicious app and legitimate app. At that point, malicious app can use its own code verifier that it sent in the first request and pass that along with the authorization code from legitimate app, and it can get itself an access token. So client impersonation is still possible. It's, it's complicated, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it seems unlikely that someone would be able to pull it off, but they, they could, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to skip these, but I'll make these, uh, I'll make these slides available for anyone that wants them. Uh, but essentially, you know, I mean, what this says, like, uh, these OAuth RFCs keep coming out, like, constantly. And it's, it's evolving and changing, and nothing's perfect. You know, it's, it's just all about, you know, uh, implementing the best flow you can. And if you're using implement, uh, the implicit flow right now, you don't have to, like, just you know, freak out and go, oh my god, we're, we're, we're vulnerable, we need to implement PKCE. Most likely, it's probably pretty fine. But if you're ever going to make changes, just, it's, it's important to, to please look at PKCE because it will, it will save you a world of trouble and you get, you get refresh tokens, so that's great. So that's about it. Uh, I have two minutes for questions if anyone has any. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you.